Money should never be the reason why you do something creative because you risk not doing the right thing because it's about the money and not about the creative result. This is the Creative Voyage podcast, a long-form interview show with the mission to help creative professionals to level up. I'm your host, Mario De Picolzuane. I'm a creative professional myself, active in the fields of graphic design, art direction, and creative consulting. In this podcast, I present in-depth interviews with some of the world's most inspiring creative professionals, revealing the stories that shape their lives and careers, plus actionable strategies to help you take your mindset and skills to the next level. I invite you to join me on this journey. In this episode, I talk to Nina Brun, a designer, transporter, and consultant. As a designer went industry professional, Nina has carved out a niche on the Nordic design scene as the leading source on interior trends, color knowledge, and design forecasting, as evidenced in several features, including Wallpaper, Design Milk, Herald Tribune, Washington Post, and many others. Also, as an accomplished designer, Nina has received a Red Dot Design Award and has her work accepted in the permanent collection at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. In 2016, Nina established her creative consultancy based in Copenhagen. With commercial insights, experience, and a personal passion, they create customized solutions within the fields of trends, colors, product design, graphics, and visual brand identity. I also had a pleasure of working with Nina on a couple of projects, and I really admire her attention to detail, professionalism, and especially her energy, which she always brings to the table. In this episode, we're going to listen to the highlights of the conversation I had with Nina in Copenhagen during the three days of design 2019. It was recorded in front of a live audience at the Oro, a hybrid space facilitating and celebrating human interaction, connection, and artistic expression through uniting design, work life, hospitality, and community in one. In our conversation, we cover topics such as advice to young professionals who are just starting, working with a personal assistant, what is transporting and how Nina does it, ideas on how to continually grow and develop yourself, and much more. Nina Brun comes from a creative family, so in a way, she always felt that that is where her life was going. Hence, she finds her work as a part of her social legacy. Perhaps as a part of the natural youthful rebellion, for a few years, she did very different things, including a short stint as a real estate agent. But all those things weren't fulfilling, and through that she realized that creativity is more than her heritage, it was her calling. Despite that, and the fact that she holds a master's degree in furniture and spatial design from the Royal Danish Academy of Design, it took until her later 20s, while working on her first job at Mudo, to start feeling like a creative professional. In her own words, meeting the world with what I did as a professional made me feel professional. The first lessons we learn at those early stages of our careers are often hard-earned and extremely valuable. So I began my conversation with Nina, asking her about the advice she would give her younger self at the time, but also to young professionals who are just starting out today. I I remember um, when I started working with Muto, I was surrounded by some extremely talented designers and, and professionals. And I felt like I weren't able to do anything. I thought I knew nothing. They talked about other designers and I would be like, I have no clue who they're talking about. And I I did my best to become wiser on in the industry. So every time someone mentioned someone that I didn't know who was, mm-hmm. I would go home and I would Google it to become wiser. <laughs> yeah. And I actually just, I would want to tell myself to relax because it takes time. It takes time to become um, a talented designer. It takes time to know the industry. Yeah. And, yeah. and and I think it took me half a year to actually feel like that I was able to do something. And it's an advice that I've given a lot of people along the way who's been like frustrated about the fact that they didn't feel like they were able to do anything when they started a new job. They yeah. found it really difficult and they felt that they weren't good enough. And it takes time to feel good enough and it's all right because you are good enough and you're going to get wiser and it's, it just takes time. So then let's kind of follow that thread. And I guess this is one piece of advice to relax. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then I'm curious, there's like more and more young professionals joining the creative industry. And the industry itself is becoming in a way maybe more complex. 
because mm -hmm. the fields are merging and there's a lot of disruptive things happening as well. And I'm sure you work with a lot of young talent as well, also like doing things like this or doing like your talks, but also in your studio. So I'm curious if you have any like piece of advice for like people who are entering into creative industry, either as in general, like a creative professional or like more specifically, like in, in design and yeah, yeah. In interiors. If, if we talk about young creative people uh, as in, in when they're still studying, I want to say, and it's, it's maybe, it, it seems wrong because it's a little bit the opposite of relaxing, what I'm going to say now, <laughs> but um, I found it, it, it very fruitful to, to do a lot of work on the side of my s uh, studies. Mm -hmm. um, I had my own company alongside um, uh, doing uh, my, my bachelor and my master's. I started okay. a little company where I worked as a graphic designer. Uh, on the side of that, I had a creative job at a newspaper uh, where I was an um, informative uh, graphic designer. And I think being out and a part of a business a big business, which the newspaper was, it, it helped me to understand uh, what it takes to be a part of a company. I learned so much along the way, and I think that I really got a lot of things with me on that journey, so to speak. I mean, when I started on the other side and I had finished my master's, I already knew so much about being in a company that was a creative company, and I, I think that's yeah. very important. So I want to say if you can if you can get internships uh, if you can get a, a good job I know it's hard I know it's hard but but um that's my best advice try try as many things as possible yeah. and try to be a part of a company I was an intern at Muto when I was um at the school of design and that was also why I got a job afterwards and that job was absolutely a stepping stone to the career that I have today And in the same topic, let's say if somebody, that young professional, is looking at you today and it's inspired and it's like, oh, I want to be somewhere where Nina is when I get there, but like in my way, let's say, mm -hmm. is there anything else that you could advise? Because the thing is, I guess what you kind of do at the beginning or doing your studies can be in a way different than kind of how to yes. go through uh, all these different... Yeah, I want to say I find it quite important to, and I'm not talking necessarily about social media, but... Having um, an online presence, mm -hmm. I think that's quite important. It can be a, uh, it's, it, it can be quite easy to make your own website to make sure that people can always find you and you build up a portfolio, even if it's your school projects. Build that portfolio and make it possible for people to find you and see yeah. who you are. Yeah. And don't be afraid to show your work. Be be proud. I mean, be proud of what you do, even if it's a two week project. Yeah. Thinking about my own way and my approach to that, I decided for myself when I was at the design school that I wouldn't be afraid of the press. I had a lot of fellow students who wouldn't want to talk to the press because they were shy, and I have full respect for that. But I think it's a good decision to decide for yourself yeah. not to be afraid. I did a school project that I sent off to a competition, competition for students, and I, and I, and I won that competition, which resulted in me being, being proud of the project sending it out in the world different blocks and that resulted in me having so many image hits on google and i ended up getting an email from the museum of arts and design in new york asking if they could require my chair for their permanent collection and it's there today in the permanent collection which is amazing but that was only because i was like okay i'm gonna send it out in the world i'm gonna yeah. send this picture yeah. of this chair to someone who might post it and i did that quite a lot try to get my work out even though it was these short school projects as the famous quote by Jin Rome goes formal education will make you a living self-education will make you a fortune I believe that self-education is a crucial part of our job as creatives and entails the development of our craft and professionalism I was curious to hear how Nina manages that I actually, I do spend a lot of time thinking about exactly that these days. I've had two and a half years with my own company and it's been going really fast. We're seven people in my company today. And I've gone from being an employee to becoming a leader over two and a half years. And I still have so much to learn. And I find it hard to keep on getting wiser, getting better, staying curious when I still have the company strategy to look at. All the mm -hmm. clients, as you mentioned, all these things that gives butter on the bread but i i really try to stay curious so i try to listen to good podcasts i love podcasts i try to read try to go to talks 
try to go to fairs, but it's something that I would actually like to put into my calendar mm-hmm. to sort of actually give the time that it deserves and, yeah, yeah. and needs in order for me to become better professional or more professional. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I started doing that. Like one of the things I want to do like yeah. in, in my life mm-hmm. is like read books. Yes. Like one, one of the best resources, learn yeah. and grow. And then I actually started having like a thing in my calendar where it's like read a book. That's like, amazing. Like, and it means like to be, it can be like 15 or 20 or 30 minutes a day. It can be an audio book or printed book, but it's like a thing which is yeah. like yeah. every day there. And there's like that and a couple of other like small things, which I like, let's say if, if I check that off, yeah. I'm good. It's like a success. Yeah. I think another thing that I that's important for my growth is to just being curious in, in everyday life. Mm-hmm. It was funny. I tried to be quite aware of that. I just went to Italy and to try to take pictures of things that I found quirky and beautiful and funny, but that has nothing to do with the industry. But just to collect these beautiful aesthetic moments Mm -hmm. that could be some beans on a plate or it could be the ceiling of a beautiful building. So try to, to stay curious and bring these things that has nothing to do with my professional life into my professional life. Yeah. So yeah. I just used a lot of these pictures in my presentation in London. Um, and I just found that really nice to sort of connect it that way around, um, to be aware of things that are not beautiful because it was made to be beautiful, but it's beautiful because it is as it is. This, I often say yes to things that I find really uh, hard. Let's do an example. I, I find it really nice to sit here now. It's, it's, it's a conversation. But doing a talk, I find that very challenging and I can get really nervous. I like the conversation way better. I just went to London to do this talk and I without a doubt said yes because I was really scared of it. I was really scared of going and doing this talk for some, some people that are really hardcore professionals. People that I really respect yeah and to stand there in front of so many people and being the expert I've, i i can find that hard at times but but it's very much saying yes to things that i'm scared of in order to get wiser and better at what i do do you think that's something that's part of your character in a way or like were you yeah. like that like always like let's say yeah you, i you, i've had periods of my life where i was way more shy and um, i think i'm i'm very extrovert but i'm also a bit introvert at times there are things that i yeah, i do find it hard before going to this talk in london i uh, contacted my my mother's cousin who's an actor mm-hmm. and she does these presentation technique courses ah, okay so i did that with her oh that's and good. and i actually think i'm <laughs> gonna do it again because it was really good but i still felt that i i could use a little more help yeah, yeah. because I, i i really admire people who are good at presenting i yeah. think that's so cool Or yeah, doing yeah. a speech or whatever it is, yeah, yeah. even though it's at a family uh, birthday or something. Yeah. yeah, I really want to be good at it. Yeah. And I guess some people are natural at it, at yes. it but most people actually aren't. The, the people that we see and usually admire just like work their way up yeah. to that and yeah. probably been doing like hundreds of or thousands of talks. Yeah. And then we see one talk and we're like, oh, wow. Yeah. But I also think that is, that, that is something that I need to work at is the fact that I believe, I find it hard that I'm not good at it. I need to understand that I need to earn being good at it. Nina works as a designer, transporter, stylist, and leads a successful design consultancy. She's extremely multifaceted, so I was interested in hearing about her schedule. Here she talks about her work routines and why hiring a personal assistant was the best investment she ever made. I travel so much. So this year alone, I've been away for almost 50%. Okay. I've been very much away from the office. So it's hard to say that I have a routine, but I have to say that routine is the most important thing for me. I really miss having a routine when I'm not home at the office. Mm -hmm. I have a PA, which is the best investment that I've ever made because... I'm so much a creative. I don't like to write emails. I don't like to uh, be super, um, what do you call it? Doing all the administration things and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I really don't like that. So she is really good at routine. She okay. helps me a lot at having a routine. I think the most fixed uh, thing in my life uh, when we're talking about routine is I try not to work after five. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't work in the weekends if I can avoid it. Okay. Because my problem is I can work 24-7. There is so much to do all the time. So I actually try to limit my work. I do take my work with me when I'm off. Mm-hmm. So I will think about economy, a project, when I, I'm lying in my bed at night. I would lie <laughs> if I said that it wasn't that yeah. way. I yeah. spend a lot of energy on that. But when I'm at the office, I either sit in my own office, I have my own office, but I also really like to sit with my employees to be a part of, of what they do because the routine of the company or it's very important for the routine that I spend time with my employees and I sit and I work with them. So I try to catch up with all of them during maybe not a day, but at least a week. So I have one-on-one time with all of Mm -hmm. them going through projects and yeah, really make them understand that I'm there for them. If there's something that they don't understand, some of them, they work very um, independent on their uh, projects. So they will need my guidance one way or another, but they also have a lot of time on their own. So I try to spend the time with them during a week and then I have the time for myself at the office. And that's way more uh, about uh, sending out invoices, uh, making sure the bills are paid. Um, All these things that you don't think about takes a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I do have this, uh, these hours every week where I, I prioritize to sit in my own office yeah. and try not to, to be disturbed and, and, and take care of all the um, boring things. So there's a few things that I would like to unpack. Let's maybe start with what, what you just mentioned. So there's this part of kind of admin stuff. There's part of like managing, like being, being a manager and a leader. And then there's also a part where you're creating, like yeah. doing probably what we're doing more before. Yes. So I'm curious, like, how are you like juggling that? And, 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 and also maybe how is that divided these days? Let me put it this way. I'm not very good at, at jug- juggling with this. Uh, I wish I was way better at taking the time to create myself. Mm -hmm. That is for sure something that I also need to put in my calendar. Some projects are way more about being behind the computer and writing emails. And then there are the projects where you're very creative. And I've had a lot of projects lately that's been very email based. So I would really love to prioritize having the time to be creative. It's something that I can sense that I'm lacking it. I'm lacking the really creative projects where I get to be the designer. I I will never be 100% designer because I also take care of the administrative side of things. I'm probably not so good at answering this question because I'm not so good at doing it. No, no, but I was Um, curious what's actually the the current situation because that's that's always the tension between those things. Yeah. I I think what I'm I'm trying to figure out how I, in my life and in my company, can be better at doing the very creative things. I guess we in in the company call it dream projects. Mm -hmm. So projects that doesn't necessarily have a client. Because as soon as you take the client out of the equation, uh, then you have way less administration. If you can do something because you think it's funny or you think it's beautiful or you think you'll get wiser for yourself... Then, then I, that's where I get to be more creative. So I, I think if I can prioritize these projects where I get to be the client myself, that would help me. So doing projects that are uh, there to answer some dreams, I don't, I don't know. Doing some projects that are maybe only about form or only about a specific material, not about creating a, a new universe for a client. Could you describe like how is your consultancy set up currently? Like how many people there are? Like is there like a hierarchy or not? Like how do you work? I'm quite the relaxed leader, without a doubt. And there is a hierarchy, but it's it's built up. I have two graphic designers. I have a textile designer. I have a girl who's educated within communication. Mm-hmm. She's also my PA. So okay. she does communication and PR projects, and then she takes care of all of my things. And then I have two product designers. So that's the structure right now. When I'm out of the office, I will have one graphic. I mean, we're seven people, but the most experienced (laughs) graphic designer will be taking care of that part. Then I will have Sarah, who's my PA and and educator with communication. She will take care of sort of the office. And if someone needs to get a hold of me, she'll make sure that they get a hold of me if if I'm not there. And then I have uh, Reta, who is a product designer, and she's been with me from the start. And she will be in charge of, of products. So that's how it works when I'm not there. But when I'm there, I'll always take care of everything and and talk to everyone. I will always sign off of everything, uh, on everything. Um, Nothing goes out of the business without me being involved one way or another. It's very important for me that when you deal with my company, that you still deal with me. 
of course, I'm not the one who makes all the graphic design or do all the products from scratch. But it's important for me that is my ID and uh, sort of my values and, and quality that you, you get from, from working with my company and not only working with me. And then third yeah. sub question is a bit more tactical, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, what I'm curious about is uh, how did you go about deciding to have a personal assistant? And then how did you go about getting one? Uh, because that, I think, often be a challenge. It like is. In you, do, you do invite someone into your life 100%. I mean, I only have one email in my life. So it's both the personal and the business one. So I have one person who knows <laughs> like almost everything about me, which is a little <laughs> scary at times. But I think I realized that I received so many emails and I have, we have quite a lot of projects running at once. And in order for me to, to do what I'm supposed to do to make these projects good, I needed someone to help me with all the uh, writing. There is a lot of people who would like something from me one way or another, whether it's uh, because of the my followers on Instagram, people want me to, uh, I don't do any sponsored work at all. That's not what, I don't believe that I, as a taste maker, uh, working with design and interior mm -hmm. and stuff like that, I don't believe that people can buy my opinion. So I don't do sponsored work. It's very important for me in, in, in what I do. And But there is a lot of people who would like that from me. And it's been a huge help for me to have someone to help me to say no. She's yeah. like my filter. Because yeah, okay. I'm not the one saying no. She's the one saying no. And I am a sensitive person. I would lie if I said anything else. So it's always good for me to have someone to help me to say no. Also when it's a client who yeah. wants uh, 50% off of the price or whatever it is. It's quite amazing to have someone that you trust and someone who can, without blinking and without feeling insecure, just write, you know what, I'm sorry, but this yeah. is the way it is. Yeah. And I found her, or she was actually already with me in the company because she was already my employee. Okay. And she's super effective. So she just had way more time than I had work for her uh, sort of field. So suddenly it just makes sense to, to give her that role because she really wanted it. Ah, okay. She's the only non-creative person in my company. And I think it's been quite important for her and her role to be so included. She knows everything about me and, yeah. and everything that I do. And because she's not creative, it's giving her another important role in the company. She feels very included. I think it was a very good decision when you think about that yeah, part yeah, of, yeah, of yeah, the yeah, equation. Yeah. 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 So that was like very much organic, I guess, in a way. So organic, yeah. And I feel very lucky that it was. I, I think based on like what you hear, people have can like really struggle with finding yeah. that person that you yeah. can like trust and you can have that relationship because it is like very a sensitive role. Absolutely. And I think one of the reason why it really works is that we are opposites. Totally opposites. <laughs> like she is, not to say that I'm not structured, but you should see the way that she handles my email. It's insane. It's like if I don't answer an email in two days, she'll be like, Lena, what's up with that email? Can you please answer that email? I go home every day with an empty inbox. And I think that's quite rare to be able to say that. And I enjoy it a lot because I used to be very stressed about emails in my inbox if they were there for a long time. And now everything is answered every day, almost. Hey friends, you're listening to the Creative Voyage podcast. We're in the middle of this episode, so it's time for a short break. If you like this podcast, I'm confident you're going to enjoy the Creative Voyage monthly edit a newsletter for which every month I ask a different creative professional to curate 10 brief recommendations of cool things to inform and inspire, including books, articles, products, portfolios, podcasts, and more, and deliver it exclusively to your inbox. It's a newsletter curated by creatives for creatives. To sign up, visit creative.voyage slash newsletter. Thanks, everyone. Let's get back to the show. Due to various cultural and technological forces, it seems that it's becoming increasingly difficult to manage our creative careers. Nowadays, we have to navigate much more than what would traditionally be seen as our job. I've asked Nina to share what she thinks are the main challenges of being a creative professional working today. I do believe there's a lot of different challenges. I think it's getting better with time, but there is a lot of people 
who believe that work of creatives shouldn't cost as much as other people's work because it's something that you think and you then create with your hands or you create a shape in a computer or whatever it is. Uh, it, it, some people find it hard to understand that it takes a lot of time to do a good creative product or piece of work. I think it's a challenge that some people don't value and understand um, the work of creatives. I think that is a challenge for the industry. And when I say industry, I mean graphic, I mean photography, I mean uh, stylist work, uh, product design. I think it's something that really, um, it can be very challenging. Um, I think we we're lucky we have some good clients, but we also have some clients who who really pressure us because I don't believe they to the full extent understand how long time we put into it. How you are like trying to overcome that or like in a way that you present yourself to potential clients or like during the let's say like process of like onboarding a client is there like a way that you can yeah i really try to be transparent in the way that i work so if we have a project i really try to outline all the processes so i will tell them exactly how many hours do we believe that we spend on this part of the project of this and this and this and then i take i take everything into the budget so that means um the research concept development all these phases that a lot of people don't always remember is a part of that creative process. So really try to be transparent in, in the way that I show people how we work. I think that's quite important to really be transparent. <laughs> Do you think, is there anything else? Another challenge is that we are quite a lot of people who would love to live from being creative. We are a lot of creatives uh, and hopefully there will be more space and more work for creatives in the future because it looks like we will have more people who work from being freelancers. Uh, it looks like less and less companies are hiring all the resources that they want, but they do hire freelancers for a certain period of time. Yeah, And I think that is good for the creative industry. There's a misunderstanding nowadays undoubtedly perpetuated by the highlight reel we portray on our social media channels that others have everything figured out, which makes us feel that we are the only ones with struggles and hence in some way inferior or we merely feel bad. Of course, that's far from the truth and I think it's essential to cover those pieces of our life in our cultural discussion. So I've asked Nina what her current professional challenges are. One of my current struggles, which I also find, it's, it's very personal, actually, and it, I think it's also a very vulnerable thing for me. It causes me a lot of negative thoughts, and that is that I tend to compare myself with companies who's been on the market for a very long time. So I am very, I'm such a perfectionist, and I'm also very competitive, not so much towards other people, but ma mainly to myself. Okay. So I give myself a lot of goals to reach, which can be very hard at times. I actually, I need to relax. I need to take it. I've come so far in two and a half years, but I tend to compare myself with companies who's been on the market for so many years. And I actually forced myself to do something the other day to get myself a little down on that one. And that is, I looked up the companies that I compare myself with, and I don't feel I reached the same level as they do in, in regards to results. So I went in and had a look at all of them and saw how long time they've been on the market. And the average was 11 years. And that made me realize it's a really wrong path for me to do that. I really need to relax on that. Yeah. Because it causes me to, to doubt myself with no reason at all. Yeah. So that's something very personal, but something yeah. that I've spent a lot of energy on. I mean, I can relate that. I think it's very common to see those people or companies that we admire. Yeah. And it just looks like so perfect or like the website looks great or like their yeah. Instagram is great. And they have a Tresillion yeah. launches every week. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my God, mm. I have one a year. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's relatable yeah. for sure. And then another challenge is feeling like you're working all the time because a creative brain can be hard to turn off. I find yeah. that challenging as well. 
think it's gotten a little better, but I think that's only because I replaced all those thoughts with all the administration. <laughs> that's a hack. <laughs> it's a hack, but it's not a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's another challenge. Always thinking about work. So I might say to people, okay, don't work after five. I try not to work in the weekends. Then at the same time, I, I think about work all the time. But it's also because I love it. I, I live by my hobby and my hobby is what I live by. So that's very lucky, but that's also a challenge be because you need to find something else that you can relax with my hobby is not to i can't even like to knit or something it was that was the case i would maybe relax a little more but i guess in that sense it's also good that you as you mentioned at the beginning impose some of those limitations of leaving work at five and not working on the weekends that's like a good way to try to and i mean i i at least i have to try and then hopefully i will succeed to some extent on some of it <laughs> Among the services which Nina's consultancy provides to their clients, there's a very particular one, and that's trend spotting or trend forecasting. Generally, trends tend to be a popular topic in our visual culture and something almost everyone has an opinion on. When it comes to working with trends as a professional, though, the topic immediately becomes intricate and somewhat mysterious. As an expert on the subject, I've asked Nina how she defines and works with trends. I remember during the season one of the podcast, I talked with uh, Marian Hoss, who is a illustrator from yeah. Utrecht. And one thing that he said about that really like stuck in my mind, which was, if you follow trends, you're always behind. Yeah, I agree. But I'm curious, like, how, how do you approach that? Maybe it's important just to explain to anyone who might be listening is how I work with trends in my company. Yeah. Because how I mainly use it is I help specify materials and colors for bigger companies and it's often really really big companies so they will hire me ask me what colors and materials should we be using in three years so then i i, I make them a palette a, a lot of them i've been working with since i um started my own business so i make them a new palette every year so it's it's, it's very much a specifying role that i have for these big companies yeah. so it's a no-name job I just help them to be able to follow along, so to speak. Yeah. I very much agree with you or your uh, previous uh, visitor on the fact that you should not follow trends as it is presented to us in a lot of medias and by a lot of companies. If we take Pantone for an example, you, you cannot put one color to our time. It's impossible. And I'm also like, why should we all go right now? The color is living coral. And I'm like, if every company took that one as the trending color, no one would be trending. I don't believe it worked that way. I think I have a sort of a relaxed approach to the topic and to the term. Uh, I try really to dig into, of course, what's going on in the world that we live in. And that goes for both politics, it goes for environmental issues, it, it, fashion, social media, so many different things that we look at. But I think it's way more important to look at the company that you work with. The real analyzes is there. So looking at how they work and what values that they would like to represent, I find that being the core element in an assignment that deals with the trends. And then I take the trends into their the equation with them and figure out what is the right answer here. Mm -hmm. When I work with a company, we often it's colors. Often it's colors that I define or surfaces. It can be how shiny is an object or how matte is it. It can be, is it wool or is it polyester? But what I do if it's colors, then I make a color scheme that should last for five years, maybe 10 years. And then I have a scale that works for a season or for a year. Often it's a year. I try to push it to a year instead of it being three months or six months. When you have a scale, I really like the fact that you can combine, let's say we have 10 colors, that all of the colors go well together. So you can pick number one and you can pick number seven and they look really good together. But you can also pick number four and number five and they're really good together. So I try to make that scale and a scale that should last for like five years, let's say five years. And then you can have that. Let's take the living coral uh, from Pantone, for example. Then you have that in. Then you, you add that to the long lasting scale, a scale that you believe uh, the long lasting one you believe will be complementing a company's profile for five years. 
talking about trends, there's of course both the long lasting and the short lasting. And I'm a very like speech woman for long lasting. But that's also because I think the environment is so important. And if we went about colors and trends as they do in the fashion industry, I mean, it's only going one way. We spend so much money, so much material, and we waste. There is like a tremendous waste in that industry. And of course, there is a waste in ours as well. But I think as long as we, we try to think and look at the big picture, we can come quite a long way. So I think it's important to look at trends as something that should last a little longer than one year of a pink color. Part of it is, I guess, with the definition in a way. Yeah. yeah. Because often when you say trends, you think like, oh, it's this season. Yes, exactly. If you look at a color as millennial pink, if you think about acne, their uh, bags, that color has been trending since 2011. It's just something that we don't think about. But that's a fact. That's been a trending color for eight years. Yeah. And that's quite amazing. It is said to be such a trending color because it's uh, gender neutral. I, I'm not sure I agree, but it is said that it really brought the color into the men's world as well. And that it will soon have a replacement called Neo Mint. I'm excited to see if it has the same long lasting uh, <laughs> yeah, or long life. I'm not sure. I don't believe so. And how do you, when you work with, with clients, is there like a way to, or do the clients even expect you to prove the success of your consultation regarding like colors or materials yeah. or stuff? I've, how- I've, I get tested quite a lot. It's, it's quite funny. They will, I, I have meetings where I present something and then afterwards they would be like, okay, that's really lucky for you because we've seen here and there that these colors are trending too. And you're just like, what? <laughs> it's really funny. No, I mean... I defined the colors at Muto when I work with them. And it was quite interesting. You could also always, of course, I don't have the same access to my clients' sales numbers now. Yeah. Okay. But back then it was quite easy to see when you did something right and when you did something wrong. Because of course you would do, you, you do something wrong. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, that that yeah. can always happen, even though you do a great job. Times changes and so do trends as well. We've come to the last topic I've discussed with Nina. And as with other guests, I've asked her to highlight three pieces of advice based on what she learned so far on her professional journey. Here's what Nina shared with me. First of all, you should never do anything for money. Money should never be the reason why you do something creative because you risk not doing the right thing because it's about the money and not about the creative result. I think it's very important. And I think that goes very much together with the fact that if it doesn't feel right, you shouldn't do it. I've been asked to work with companies where I've said no because it didn't feel right. I couldn't see my profile and my product in their universe. Mm -hmm. And then I say no. I think it's very important to remember to say no. Of course, sometimes you have to say yes in order to make the wheels go around. Yeah, yeah. Without a doubt, I can't take that away from the big picture. But I think it's very important to say no. And that goes for, of course, every aspect in life. But yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think it's so important. When I look back at myself as a younger designer, I think I've said yes too many times because I was just so fascinated with the fact that someone wanted to work with me. So I've, I've learned that. Yeah, and then of course, <laughs> everyone says this, but it's also the most important thing. We just need to bring the environment into everything that we do. We do work with materialism. We do work with getting people to buy more objects, spend money. And I think we, we owe that to the world to, to um, make sure that we, we bring in the environment uh, where we can. And we, we should always bring it in. And sometimes, of course, it's more difficult than other times. But I, it's such an important topic. And it's important for us and for everyone else who's going to come after us. Specifically around that topic, like how do you, in your practice, kind of implement that? I got to say, I, th- I, th- I think it's, uh, it's difficult and we can get much better at it. We're not saints at all in the company, but we really try to think about it in everything that we do. We can take the, the, the product that I just launched with Menu and working with the wool instead of taking something that's synthetic. I think that's very important. So the materials, is, that's one approach. But it's also trying to get, I have a project right now with a wonderful South Korean company and I'm helping them introduce some products in Europe. And we're working on getting that produced in Europe instead of getting it produced in South Korea and sending it or getting it shipped to here. So it's also thinking about the transportation. So having things locally produced, I try to do that with as many projects as possible. But of course, it's, it, it's difficult. 
But if we, you can just get one environmental thing into every project, that should be sort of the goal. Of course, it would be great if everything was great for the environment, but but it's probably one step at a yeah. time. But it's better with one step than no step. Yeah. Then I just want to say the most important thing you can do is to surround yourself with good people. I'm not rich, but I'm rich in people. And that is the most important thing for me. So, and that, I mean, working with other professionals, doing different things, but also doing what I do is just so nice to work with good people. Amazing. Yes, that is amazing. <laughs> Great. So before we wrap it up, is there like anything else that you would like to mention? I think one one thing that I find quite important in, in the industry is is sharing, that we shouldn't be afraid of each other. That, of course, there is a competitive factor to the business. But I think we just, we will all become way better designers if we're better at sharing and caring that goes together. So I think that's important. Perfect. Thank you, Nina. Then thank we you, can Mario. Wrap this Pleasure. up. And thank you all. <laughs> hey, friends, that's it for this episode. I believe we touched on a lot of useful information for anybody out there interested in design, styling, trends, and development as a creative professional. I want to thank Nina for coming onto the show during the special live recording of the podcast at the Auto in Copenhagen. In my opinion, she holds a very relevant position in the design industry, both in the Nordics and internationally, so I'm grateful for the wonderful insights she shared with me. Links to Nina's work, as well as to some other things mentioned during our conversation, can be found in the show notes at creative.voyage slash podcast. After a long break since the completion of season one of the podcast, I'm thrilled to be back with this new episode. By the way, I've dropped the season format and will be releasing episodes organically throughout the year. Stay tuned since a lot of great things are coming up, starting with the next new episode, which is coming in two weeks. In the meantime, you can follow at Creative Voyage on Instagram, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. Until next time, my friends, take care. <laughs>